Well, joining me right here in our Lego studio to look critically at some of the things that we've achieved over time and also the challenges as well is Professor Sylvester Odion. He is a professor of political science, Department of Political Science, Lagos State University. He joins us virtually this morning. Good morning, Prof. Good morning. Good morning. Happy and Independence happy Day to you. Yes, indeed. So I'm sure you listened to the clip of our president addressing Nigerians this morning. What do you make out of it? Well, I think that the, the first point to make is that the, the uh, president of the country, you know, would always reflect on the trajectory that the country has followed you know, in the last um, uh, years of our uh, independence. Uh, usually, it's an opportunity to renew the hope, you know, uh, for, for our country, touch on policy, touch on policy issues for the country, you know, so that uh, the public population can, of course, uh, get the, the feel of what government is taking and which direction it is headed. I think that is what uh, independence broadcast does, you know, for almost every other country. But uh, this anniversary is coming at a very critical, you know, juncture in our history. Uh, Nigerians are going through a lot of hardship and, um, and they are in quest of, in quest, you know, for solution to these uh, numerous problems that they have, they have faced. That they have faced right okay so now let me ask so i think that yes. that is the point so the the president has pointed to okay um because i was about asking you how far really have we gone as a nation as a country nigeria for the past 64 years how far have we gone well nigeria has gone through um what I would call a, you know, a check had had a, has had a check a checkered history, a checkered history, you know, uh, since 1960. You know, we had uh, a, a perimeter with parliamentary democracy in the first six years, and then we then had a military coup. We, we went through a civil war, you know, that was bloody, and uh, of course, we then had uh, throughout that period a military tarekno until 79 when we again you know uh, enter into the democratic process in what is called what is called the second you know republic that process was a gate truncated in uh on the eve of 1983 and we had and we had a, re a renewed authoritarian you know rule in nigeria until 1999 uh when we re-enter into the democratic process again and of course, we've seen that um, we have not had a dedicated elite, you know, that is focused on solving the fundamental problems of the country. Rather, what we have seen is, you know, large scale avarice on the part of, you know, democratic actors in the country. I think that, that, is, that is basically the pro problem that we have in this country today, why we are not moving forward, yeah. you know, and uh, we, are, we are sort of, you know, stagnated. I, I think that is the critical uh issue today and so, uh, we need you know uh, to move beyond this uh, this this position of, of stagnation absolutely so speaking about moving beyond the stagnation you said something as regards the elites not having the right elite for the job and it begs the question really what are some of the lessons that political appointees our leaders of today can learn from the past leaders that's if we have any lessons to learn from them. Well, I think that we've had uh, great leaders in the past. If you look at the First Republic, you know, specifically, we had great leaders like Chief Obafemi Awolowo in, in, in the Western region. We had Hamadou Bello in the Northern region. You know, and we had uh, Opara and, of course, Zik in the Eastern in the region. And these, these individuals were focused on expanding the development space 
you know, of their various regions. A free education, you know, was a fundamental policy in Western Nigeria. And we are all beneficiary of that process even to today. And so, after, when we then entered into the Second Republic, we also saw what you might call, you know, uh, very clear policies about governance. You know, the, the, the parties of the Second Republic had clear policies. The UPN, the NPN, you know, the NPP, they all had clear policies. And you can point to leaders who were selfless. We had Ambrosali in Bende State of Nigeria at that time. You know, we had BC on Abanjo in the Den Oku State. We had, you know, Bolaike in the Den Oyo, you know. And so these were, these were leaders, you know, who were, who were quite focused, you know, and, and, and quite conscious of the direction they were taking their people, you know, to. Okay, so now let's move over to the citizens. Over the past 64 years, how far have we really fared enough in the participation of governance? Because oftentimes when you talk about governance and government, a lot of the times what a person feels is just persons in power. What about we the citizenry? In terms of, uh, you know, the citizens, I think that people, people feel that they are they are alienated from the political process. Huh. You know, uh, we have talked about what I call an elite, close, elite closure, in which those in government, you know, uh, all, all usually will shut out those who are not in government. And when you have that kind of situation, what you have is total, total alienation. And, and so the citizens are not part of the process. For any government to make progress, the citizens must be part of the process of governance, you know, in that in that country, and that is not really happening in the case of Nigeria. And again, because of the self-centeredness of, of the elite that are running the Nigerian state, I think that is one of the basic problems. You know, hmm. so the youth today are disillusioned, and that is why you, you see that they, they find you know vent in different in different kinds of uh, engagements. Some are you know uh, running abroad, even when they are not sure of what awaits them, you know, over there. So, so these are the backlash, you know, of policies, of leadership of this country, you know, since independence. Right. So in as much as I want to ask you about the Japa syndrome, which we've seen over time happen in a couple of years, during the, you know, the end after after the Independence um, Day celebration, after the 1960 60 celebration that we have, there are some other interesting and important factors that we should be looking about, especially as regards the health care system in the country. In the past 64 years, how have we fared? Because over time, we've seen some of the elites travel abroad ensure they have good health care system. We've seen that happen over and over and over and over. So how really have we fared in that angle? Well, I mean, the, the, the reality is just, is just there for everyone to see. I was speaking to a medical doctor who left Nigeria, you know, over 15 or 20 years ago uh, to Britain. And I asked him about the state of, you know, the health facilities in Britain. He said, where we are today in Nigeria is exactly what the British left behind in the 1970s. So that speak, speaks volume for the state of health in, you know, in Nigeria. And I think that not many people can assess, assess you know, health uh, facilities in the country today, health care in the country. And as you are aware, many of our medical doctors, well trained medical doctors, have left this country you know, those who are patriotic enough to remain in the country don't have the right facilities, you know, to go about their duties. I think that is the, that is the irony. And I was looking at um, Matana Healthcare, uh, you know, uh, document yesterday. And not many Nigerians have as, access, access to safe delivery, you know, facilities in the country. And so many, you know, in that process, you know what the Matana uh, mortality rate is in Nigeria. Right. It, it is quite appalling when you compare it to other countries of the world. So really, 
it is difficult to find a sphere in Nigeria where we have stabilized and consolidated. You know, that, that is the problem. You have to have an elite that is dedicated to moving the country forward. And when you don't have that, the country merely grows. Okay. And that is the tragedy of the Nigerian case. Yes, indeed. So news just reaching us right now says a large number of protesters have converged under the bridge in Ikeja to mark the 64th independence Nigeria anniversary. Well, the protesters say the protest is a continuation of the end bad governance protest. And right there we can see Shawore, who is one of the pioneers of the protest. And I think this protest is hashtag Fearless October protest. This is happening now at Ikeja on that bridge right here in Lagos State. And this shouldn't be shocking to the federal government because we did see that we did see that during the course of the 64th anniversary of Nigeria, there were speculations about ongoing protests and how some persons will still come out on October 1st to ensure that their voices have been heard. But let's have a feel of what is going on right now at Ikeja on that bridge. <laughs> Yes, indeed. Now, what does this mean for the nation, Nigeria? I still have my guest with me, who joins me virtually, Professor Odio. What do you make out of this protest going on right now in Lagos State? Uh, it speaks to the contradictions of the Nigerian state. There, there is, there is uh, a great deal of discontent, you know, among Nigerians, you know, today, in terms of how the government of this country, you know, is run. And so, they are expressing, you know, their 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 discontentment, you know, uh, to this um, over the, over over the, these policies that are, that are being implemented in the country. It's not new, and uh, there was of course a bad, bad governor's protest in August, and this is just a continuation, because in in in, rea in reality there has not been any fundamental, you know, change, you know, to the existential realities of Nigerians, and so you will expect more of this unless government do something fundamental to address, you know, uh, the ease of society and the contradictions of government. Now, speaking about doing something fundamental, as we tend to wrap up the conversation, what are some of those things you feel the present-day government can do and should do to ensure that come another October 1st, we don't see persons going on the streets to have their voices being heard? That the basic things we talked about is that now, now, there must be food for them. You know, there must, and to be able to do that, in Nigeria must have, have uh, employment, full, uh, full employment or employment opportunities, you know, to enable them eat a living, you know, uh, for, their, uh, for, their, for their survival. That is very important. And above all, I, I do make this point that the state of infrastructures in the country is very poor. There's no part, you can't travel by road you know, on the smooth road from one part of this country to another. You, you can hardly find any, you know, road that is well paved that you can drive through in this country. And so the facilities, you know, for running, running the countries are not there. Many, many parts of the country don't have, you know, uh, port portable water. And not even to talk about housing. So the, the government needs to focus on those basic things, you know, prioritize education. You know, and not price it out of the reach of the common man. So there, these are some of the things I feel that the government can do. And the government must, you know, indicate uh, a direction. Right now, it's like we are groping. Nobody can tell you this is the, de this is the destination, apart from rhetorics from government. Okay, and also the parts of the citizens, how can we begin to hold our leaders accountable in 30 seconds? 
what, what is going on in Nigeria? It's not that Nigerians are not holding their leaders accountable. They have, they have so alienated Nigerians that it becomes impossible, impossible to hold them accountable. Because that's what you call state capture. You know, the judiciary is captured. Uh, all the all the avenues of expressions, you know, are undermined, undermined by the government. And when a nation gets to this point where we are, there is usually an elite, elite punch. That is the only way we can move forward. And now, as we tend to leave the conversation here, what really is your Nigerian dream? And where do you see this country in the next five years, per se? In the next five years, uh, if we are to judge on the, on, the, on the basis of the reality on the ground, I, 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 cannot, I don't see anything you know, very promising on the crystal ball. But the, the point I can make you know, uh, is that Nigerians must take their destiny in their hands. They must begin to push in such a way that accountable you know, to the people. Okay, yes, yes, indeed. We must have and take our destinies into our hands. Well, we've been talking about the 64 years of independence, assessing it, achievements, and of course, setback. And I have been speaking to Professor Sylvester Odio. He is a professor of political science, Department of Political Science, Lagos State University. Thank you so much for being a part of the show this morning. Thank you for having me. Yes, indeed. Okay, now, in the words of the former vice president of Nigeria, Osi Banjo, he says, and I quote, that Nigeria's greatness lies in its diversity. Nigeria's greatness lies in its diversity. Happy 64th celebration, Nigeria.